Good morning, church. Would you all stand with us if you're able? It's good to be with you all as we worship the Lord together. Come just to be reminded of his faithfulness, of his loving kindness. I was thinking this morning just on the drive here just about how much of our life is spent um, just trying to to feel as if we belong. So we, we work hard, we strive, and we do all these things that just in an effort to try to belong, whether it's in the workplace or in school or wherever you find yourself. And, uh, and this is the only place in our life, really, that we get to gather together and that we belong because Jesus says we do. And we just get to rest in that uh, invitation. So wherever you find yourself this morning, whatever your energy level is, however distracted or scattered you may feel, just know that Jesus welcomes you as you are, that you don't have to do anything to belong in his family, just to receive his love, the gift of his grace. So let's just remember that. If you just, uh, maybe even just close your eyes right now. Just allow yourself to be still in his presence. Just create room even in your heart for more of his spirit this morning. Come just to rejoice in God's inexhaustible strength. We don't have to muster up more. He's got it covered. Can we align our hearts with His? Ephesians chapter 3 says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all of God. Heavenly Father, we come just to be filled this morning. Our cups are empty and we're forgetful. And so we need you, Lord Jesus. We cry out these songs of worship and these songs of praise just as prayers to you, acknowledging who you are, reminding our own souls, God, of our need for you. That you do a work in our hearts this morning and just have your way, Lord, with us. Would you bring your peace, Lord, and just allow it to wash over us this morning. We love you, Lord Jesus. We're thankful for the breath in our lungs. We praise you and we worship you. Let us go to the Father, through the Son, and by the Spirit. Light in the darkness, my God, that is true. 
yourself working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop
we stand before the holiness of God. Our humanity is laid bare, and so every week we come and we confess to the Lord our sin, to ask the Lord to do what only He can do, to soften our hearts by the power of His Spirit, to realign our hearts with His. So I just invite you in this time to join me as we read this corporate prayer of confession. Just confessing our sins to the Lord, and we'll have a time afterwards, just a private confession and prayer to the Lord. Let's read this together. Father, we confess our hearts are prone to wander from your love and from your ways. Forgive us for not pursuing your best for us, for chasing paths that lead us away from you instead of closer to you. Jesus, thank you for being the way, the truth, and the life in the world of lies, betrayal, and death. You are the true and faithful God for our guide for us on our journey. Holy Spirit, lead us to enter the narrow gate. Help us to hear your voice and to follow your lead. Teach us to abide in your love that we may bear fruit that looks and sounds like Jesus.
church family. As we continue in our time of worship this morning, um, part of the, the posture that we desire to walk in is not only receiving the goodness of God, the love of God, but also in giving, um, in giving of our time, our gifts, um, our treasure, that we would submit fully to what he has for us. And we want to acknowledge that um, Many of us are in a place of need, whether financially or emotionally or spiritually. And please, please walk in the freedom to let one of the pastors or staff people here know. Um, we're in a dark, heavy season of life, and it's real. And as the body of Christ, if we're not moving towards one another and willing to bear one another's burdens, I don't know what we're doing. So would you um, just know this is a place you can come as you are and get needy out loud. If you would join me in this prayer of generosity, we'll read this together. Holy Father, there is nothing I have that you have not given to me. All I have and all I am belong to you, bought with the blood of Jesus. To spend everything on myself and to give without sacrifice is the way of the world that you cannot abide. But generosity is the way of those who confess Jesus as their Lord, who love him with free hearts, who serve him with renewed minds, whose hearts are rooted in your kingdom, not in the systems of the world. Holy Spirit, grow our hearts in generosity until it can be said, 
that there is no needy person among us. Lead us to be generous because you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your sons and daughters to share your traits and to show what you are like to all the world. Amen. If you feel led to give this morning, you can do that online. There's also a box in the back. If you feel the need to give in other ways, in service, please, again, talk to one of our staff people. There are lots of ways to serve. Would you remain standing if you're able as I read the word this morning? Our passage comes from John 3, verses 1 through 15. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. The word of the Lord. to learn what it is to worship Jesus together. Uh, and when we say worship Jesus, what we mean is an entire life that is oriented towards him. An entire life that, that is shaped by the finished work of Jesus Christ uh, and his incarnation, his, his life, the miracles, the teachings that he, he, he gave and performed, his death, his burial, his resurrection. All of these things shape the very fabric of who we are, and, and worship is a Godward life. And so when we talk about salvation, which if, if you're visiting us for the first time or if you're relatively new here, that's what we've been talking about for, for the last few weeks and, and what we'll be talking about for a few more is about salvation. And we're looking at different aspects of the way that God saves us. 
And if you want to talk about salvation, the, the goal of salvation is not simply conversion. The goal of salvation is new life. New life. Not new life that begins when you die or in the end of all things, but new life that begins the moment you believe. New life that begins the moment you fix your eyes on Jesus. And new life that is made new again and again and again the more we gaze upon the crucified God. The resurrected king and see ourselves anew in him. That's what we're talking about. New life. And, and very specifically, that's what we're talking about this morning. The phrase that, 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 we're, that we're using, the title that we're talking about is, is the, the component of salvation is, is regeneration. Now, if that's a word you haven't heard before, uh, regeneration is simply the, the making of alive or making new that which was dead, right? And so if you think about it in terms of, and, and you know what, like, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of myself. It has been weeks since a Marvel reference, and that streak is going to end right now, right? But if you think about Wolverine, who is an X-Man. And his power is regeneration. So when he gets hurt, when he gets cut, when he breaks a bone, it heals itself and it heals quickly. That's the process that we're talking about. Something that was dead, broken, torn, made new, made whole, made alive again. And this is what happens to us by the power of the Spirit of God through the work of the Son of God according to the will of the Father. God. We are made alive. And it's huge. It's so central to who we are. And this story is a wonderful way of explaining the importance of regeneration, of new life, the need for it, the beauty of it, the, the way that we come to experience it. It's all here. It's all here. And this story, and it begins with a man who's named as a Pharisee, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews who comes to Jesus at night. Now, I often, I, I, I like context. I think context is really important, right? For, for everything that we're reading, for everything that we're studying, even when we jump around a little bit scripture like we're doing in this series, it's important to see what's going on here. And when you read the Gospel of John, which you really should, it's such a wonderful book. When you read the Gospel of John, certain themes emerge. And one of those themes is very creational, right? And John starts with creation. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. This very broad and kind of repetitive statement stating that the word of God, Jesus, was God, was with God in the beginning. And that through the word of God, all that was made was made. John doesn't specify the mechanics of how it happened, except to say that the agency that, that started all things is Jesus. And this creational theme carries into what he says. In the word was life, and the life was the light of of humanity, of men. And it says the light shone, it shined. I, I memorized this in the King James Version, so you're going to have to bear with me as I like, translate it to like English that we speak, right? But the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it, but not. Right, no. But the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness couldn't overcome it. And so here's this recreational theme that begins in the beginning of John. Where Jesus, the word, is the agent of creation, and therefore we can anticipate that he's going to be the agent of recreation. And part of what that creational life-giving thing is to do is to take people or to take the world from darkness into light. Think about the way that, that even Genesis 1 is framed, right? So we're going, this is a deep dive we're going into. But think about the way that, the, that, that Genesis 1, it's a song, it's a poem. It's got verses and a refrain. And the refrain after each day, after each stanza is, there was evening, there was morning, the first day. Now, how do we say that? Well, it was morning and then it was evening. It was, it was day and then it was night. That was a day. 
But Genesis, Genesis 1 has us looking at it opposite. It was evening, and then it was morning the first day. And there's this movement that John is picking up on where the creational work of God moves us from darkness into light. We even talked about it last week. It's why you were called out of darkness into light. They say all of that. Because then it, it actually becomes this very interesting literary device and choice that the story that we hear about Nicodemus happens at night. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the cover of darkness. But that darkness also reveals and exposes in Nicodemus a darkness that even he doesn't see. So we come to Jesus by cover of night with these questions. I love it. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He's in darkness, and we're about to see Jesus shine light on him. And he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, unless, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What, what a weird response, right? Can we acknowledge this? Nicodemus is like, hey, Jesus, let's talk. For whatever reason, this needs to be at night, right? And Jesus agrees to meet him. And Nicodemus opens up with a seemingly positive statement. We see you. And, and we know that you are a teacher from God because no one can do these signs, these things that you do unless God is with him. What's happened? I mean, in, in the Gospel of John, not much actually. Jesus has called his disciples. He turned water into wine at a wedding, and he cleansed the temple. Okay, so actually quite a bit, <laughs> right? Jesus is talking through, and Jesus is performing these miracles, and he's saying that something new is coming. That's what the water into wine is about. That's what the cleansing of the temple is about. Something new is here. And they're seeing it. And they're seeing and hearing what Jesus is saying and doing, and they're starting to take notice including, and maybe even especially, the religious leaders. They are catching a glimpse. They're getting just a taste, a preview of what Jesus is doing, and they are interested. Now, some are concerned. I believe that Nicodemus is earnest here, that he is trying to inquire of Jesus What's this about? Tell, tell me more. We know that these signs can only happen from the teacher who comes from God. And Jesus' response to him is, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom? What, what's going on here? I mean, it's, it's pretty simple in some ways, but it needs to be unpacked. What Nicodemus has seen can only be described as manifestations of the kingdom of heaven on earth as performed by the king himself. So when we see the miracles of Jesus, when we hear the teachings of Jesus, when we see the signs and wonders of Jesus, these are promises of a coming kingdom, one that we desperately need. Nicodemus saw and knew it then, and we ought to now. When we talk about new life, when we talk about regeneration, the first thing that we need to see is that, that in order to, to understand the fullness of what that is, we need to see that the, the kingdom is in our midst. Our, our hearts long for it. Right? I could say, just think about the last two weeks. But then I could say, just think about the last six months and the last couple years. But if we're honest, like, just think about the totality of your life that you've been aware of what's going on in the world. And there are all of these promises for a way that the world can be better. 
right? If, if people will just be educated enough, if, if the right economic systems and structures are in place, if the right sort of mentality about how we order people in space, the right political regimes, parties, systems are in place, all of these things, if we can end this, if we can start that, if we can come together, if we can just pass this thing, if all of these promises, every promise that we see is for a better life, whether it's the big overarching political promises or whether it's just Corona promising you that for just a moment, if you twist the cap, stick a lime in there and take a sip, you can go to your kingdom and your kingdom is a beach. Right? And then, then they evangelistically invite you to find your beach. Find it. Right? But what is that? What are they asking you? Right? Of course it's absurd. Right? People in, in Minnesota in January don't crack open a corona and all of a sudden they're like, I don't need this burger. Whatever you wear, I don't know. Which, I, I hate the cold. Right? Like they don't, that doesn't happen. What are they promising you? Just a moment of escape. A moment of escape. A moment of life that is good. Why is that promise so compelling? Right? Because from early in our lives, we recognize how hard life can be. And the older we get, we see how persistent the difficulties of life actually are. We need something new. We need a better way. And now here comes Jesus. And he says, this wine, I got the new wine. He says, this temple, let's clean it. Let's get ready. There's, there's one who knows what's in your heart. There's a kingdom coming, a better way, a better life, a better reality, a truer one. All of these things, all of the good that we have here on earth is only a, a shadowy reflection, is a shadow cast from the good that is to come, heaven on earth. And, and Jesus comes living and proclaiming that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he's demonstrating and he's living it. And when you catch a glimpse of that, then your desire, like Nicodemus's, is to understand it and to get more of it. But you have to see it. You have to catch that glimpse. In some ways, my mind gets drawn to Paul talking in, in Romans 10 when he says, like, how will they believe what they haven't heard? And how will they hear what hasn't been proclaimed to them? And how will they hear it unless we go, unless we send those to proclaim it? There is a sense in which you can't yearn for what you don't know or see or have a sense of. Like, we know we want something more. But what that something more is, we can't name until someone comes and proclaims and demonstrates it. And in Jesus, we see the proclamation and the demonstration of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And I want to take a brief aside here to say that if you are a follower of Jesus, that is a part of what we do. We give, or we are called to give people a glimpse, a demonstration of the kingdom of God that is here already, but not yet in its fullness. Of the king that is coming to make all that is wrong right. Of the God of love who brings those who are on the outside in, who meets every need. When we proclaim Jesus with our lips and when we demonstrate Jesus with our actions, we give people a glimpse of the kingdom. And it's those things, not our like bickering over our rights and what we can and can't do, not our like bickering over the minutia of theology. Listen, I love theology and doctrine. I'd love to have a conversation with you about it. Uh, a fire pit, bourbon, and, and, and theology? Let's go, you know? <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's not the, like, nitpick theology that people see and either say, I want to know and see more of that, or I want to see less of that. It is the demonstration 
the proclamation of the kingdom that we make with our very lives. So as a church here in Durham, we're called to demonstrate the kingdom so that like Nicodemus, people might, many might come and say, look, we see these things and that's not of this earth. And then Jesus, who just in, in, in the end of chapter 2, uh, John says, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about people for he himself knew what was in people. Jesus, the very one who knows and sees to the heart, hears what Nicodemus says and immediately interprets it rightly. Nicodemus says, no one can do these things unless they come from God. And Jesus says, you want a glimpse. You want more. You want more of the kingdom. You want more of this. And no one can see the kingdom unless they are born again. Jesus is saying that there is a new way, a new life coming, but the only way to experience it is to be made wholly new, to be born again. Now, listen to Nicodemus's response for a second. He says, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? All right? Nicodemus was earnest before. Nicodemus is being sarcastic here. Like, you have to understand that. Nicodemus, Jesus says, aren't you the teacher of the Jews? Uh, he's already been a ruler of the Jews and a Pharisee. He's a studied, learned man. He's not asking Jesus, can a man go back into his mother's womb and come back out? Like, he knows that's not the case. What Nicodemus is saying is, Jesus, you're saying there's a new way, a kingdom that is coming, new life, and the way to do it is I can't just be made better. I can't be fixed up. I can't have one or two parts tinkered with. I have to be made completely new. You are saying the way into the kingdom is wholly new life, and I don't think that's possible. Don't believe it. It would be easier, in a sense, is what Nicodemus is saying. It would be easier for me to get into my mother's womb and be born again than for new life to happen. And I want to pause and sit there for a minute. Like to let that weigh on your hearts. Because more of us are Nicodemus than we care to admit. Even those of us who call ourselves, who fashion ourselves, followers of Jesus. Jesus says the way to the kingdom is not minor modification. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not a new law. It's not legalism. There is no culture pure enough. No obedience, like strict enough. No righteousness, no piety high enough to see the kingdom of God. It demands new life. And if that is what it demands, then that is actually available to you, to me. Think about that. The brokenness of life. Love. Joy. Hope. Like, we are not stuck in an endless cycle of death, hatred, violence, curse, and brokenness, there is a way to be made wholly new. We need it. More than that, if new life is the only way, then it demands, it demands that you acknowledge that what you need is more than a tune-up. It demands that, it, that you acknowledge that what you need is more than three application points after an hour on Sunday. 
or 30 minutes in devotional. You need new life. We must be born again. And so Nicodemus says, how is that possible? That's not possible. Right? That's what he's getting at when he says, how can someone who's old enter into his mom's womb a second time? And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, unless one is born into life and is born of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, I love the like anti, uh, like this is what Jesus does. The first time he says, if anyone is not born again, they can't see the kingdom of God. Can't see it. Now he says, unless you're born of water and spirit, you can't enter into it. Now think about the differences between that, right? Think about uh, uh, when you're driving into, and I, I love this, and I've always loved this since I was a child. Like there's something about driving to New York City, and you see it from a distance. You begin, the road signs are there, it's getting closer and closer, but then you get to this point where you see it. They're like, look at that. And we're still so far away. And you get closer and closer and closer. And my favorite way into the city, minus the fact that you have to pay like $100 just to get into that, right, is, is the tunnel. And you see it, then you go under, but then you enter into it. And it's just this amazing, like, immersion and immersion in it. Right? And once you enter into the city, then you get to, to, to experience and participate in all of the... Now, some of you are like, I hate cities. This is the worst thing ever. Why would anyone want that? I love it, though. You get to, you get to participate in all that it has. Right? The, the hustle and the bustle, the pizza, all, all, all of the good things that, that you can think about. And you know, I've named two things. You guys are like, you don't like me. Uh, right? But, but you get the point, right? You get to enter into it and to participate in it and, and actually be there. And Jesus is saying, you can see it and you can enter into it, but you must be born again. Now, I want to quickly clarify that when he says born of water and spirit and he says born again, these are the same things. Unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And you see Nicodemus, now he just says it outright. There's no beating around it anymore. How can this be? this be? And here we are. We are desperately in need of something new. And Jesus promises us something new as we find regeneration and new life. And so, so Jesus says to him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to, what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I explain to you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except for he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus is setting the stage. You want to know how to get to the kingdom? You want to know how to be born again? There is one person, the Son of Man, who can both demonstrate and give access to the kingdom of God. This is remarkably exclusive and yet at the same time unbelievably inclusive. Jesus says, I, the Son of Man, am the way that you are born again and enter into the kingdom of heaven. The one who descended is the one who can ascend, which means you got to be linked to him to ascend, to see, to enter, to experience, to demonstrate the kingdom of God. Jesus is centering regeneration around himself. And this is what he says to do it. He uses Numbers 21. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You want to be born again, then you need to be like the Israelites who looked at the serpent in the wilderness. Let me tell you that story, and then we'll finish this up. Numbers 21. I believe it's verses 4 through 9. The people of God are in the wilderness, and they are angry. Turns out, like the food in the wilderness isn't farm to table. Right? Like there's not happy hour in the wilderness or brunch. 
There's bread every day from heaven. Bread every day from heaven. Manna. And you drink when you can. As you're walking and it's hot and it's barren and it's not, it's not, and they are complaining, they are angry. And beyond that, they are beginning to doubt again and again and again, I should say. They are doubting that God will do what God has said that God will do. And so God causes, it's a very strange story, God causes poisonous snakes to come up from the dirt and to bite the people. In some ways, I kind of wish this was its own sermon because what? (laughs) Right? But yeah, so then they all all fall on the ground and they're writhing in pain and they're dying and they're looking and they're like, Moses, save us. You don't do anything two seconds ago. Now please save us. Which is reasonable, right? If you're dying, like save me. And so Moses talks to God and God says, craft a bronze serpent and lift it up. And tell everybody who is sick and dying and writhing in pain, all they have to do is look at the serpent that you've crafted on a stick, and they'll be healed. Right? And so Moses does, and he holds it up, and and he says, look, look on the serpent, and, and all of those who did were healed. Like, it's a remarkable story, but what happens here? They are cursed by their unbelief. They are cursed by their exchanging of the truth of God for a lie. And then God tells his servant to fashion something in the likeness of their curse, to to nail it to a stick, which is in and of itself in the law a curse. Show them the curse cursed. Follow me? It's a lot of curses. Show them the curse cursed. And tell them to look at it and they'll be healed. Their salvation is looking on the death of their death. Their salvation is looking upon the cursing of their curse. And in the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent, Jesus says, so too the Son of Man will be lifted up, not as Moses, though he is our great and glorious Moses, but as the serpent. Jesus becomes the likeness of that which curses us. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus himself is lifted up, the crucified God, the crucified Messiah, the embodiment of our curse, now defeated, nailed to death, put to shame. Death is defeated in the crucified Christ. And the kingdom is, is, is a glance away. That's what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. You want new life and new resurrection? Then you have to acknowledge that you are in dire straits. There's nothing you can do to get yourself out of this situation. And that this ridiculously foolish plan that God has concocted, namely putting the curse on a tree and hanging it up before you actually is the only plan that saves. And you have to gaze at it with full expectant hope and belief. Right? You're not going to look up at it if you don't think it's going to win. You're not going to look to Jesus if you don't believe that he will make you new. But he does. And he will. And it bears out in your life. And we're going to talk about this next week when we read the, the next bit of John chapter 3. But that's what, mean, what it means, right? So often we hear this verse out of context, but it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's that verse. Jesus, the Christ, our redemption, lifted up, despised, Shamed, separated, scorned, cursed, so that we who were cursed might have new life. Now and forever. And that is the invitation. Always. Are you far from Jesus? Are you uncertain of this new life? Do you not look to Jesus? 
Have you been following Jesus for decades now? kind of feel like you've got this figured out, look to Jesus. Look to your crucified king. Be made alive. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that even this morning, many would find life in you. God, that we would see and enter into this kingdom that we catch glimpses of. And for those of us who see it and have entered into it by the work of Jesus, by your grace and by your love, God, that we would rightly image that kingdom forth demonstrate that kingdom to those around us so that they would see our love for one another and be drawn in, so that they would see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. Let us not grow weary of doing good, but instead let us fix our eyes. Crucified King, dead no longer, now raised. Uh, each week we hear the gospel and we respond to it in a few ways. One of the ways that we do is by worshiping. Um, we're going to come to the table in a bit, but now let's just stand. Let's sing to the God who saves to the uttermost and who brings new
Each week, we're reminded of the work of Jesus in life, death, and resurrection. And each week, we're invited to this table, the Lord's table, set for his people. And when you think of the table this morning, and we think about the kingdom of God, I want you to think about the table stretching throughout all the earth, throughout all time. And all of his people, every tribe, tongue, and nation gathered at the table, eating together. This is the table of Christ. The one where when he ate with his friends, he broke bread. And as he broke it, he said, this is my body, broken for you. Friends, the Lord Jesus was broken so that you might be made whole. And in the same way, taking the cup as he gave thanks for it, he said, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant shed for the remission of sins. Each time we gather together, we eat and drink in remembrance of Jesus. And so if Jesus is your hope, I would invite you now to peel back that first layer to take the bread, the body of Christ broken for you. Now go ahead and peel back that, that second layer. The blood of Christ was shed for you. Drink and be thankful. And before we sing the last song, I just want to make a reminder announcement. Um, in the same way that Jesus demonstrates his love and grace by welcoming strangers, outsiders, foreigners to his table, we demonstrate that to others by welcoming the outsider, by welcoming the foreigner. In fact, Jesus says that's one of the ways that, that those who are his are identified, and that when we do that, we're welcoming him in. And um, we have an opportunity just immediately after the service to hear about ways that we can be involved in welcoming in to Durham, to the Triangle, to our lives, to our hearts, refugees. And I would invite you to, to if, if you've signed up, stay. If you haven't, stay. Like, there's food. I, I think there's enough. If not, we can get more. But, but let's hear about ways that we can care for folks like now <laughs> and today. So um, if you would, let's keep singing, but just keep that in mind.